In the video you're about to watch, I'll be inviting you to look with me at a work of art. Though I'm not an artist myself and I don't have qualifications in art history or art appreciation, I will tell you some facts and background. But I'll also share some personal responses about what it seems to me is going on beneath the surface. That'll really be about, do you see what I see? Maybe you'll see something very different. Let's see together. Now what we're looking at uh, today is a painting by a man called Gentile de Fabriano and it was uh, painted 600 years ago, 1423. And uh, I first came across this painting years ago as this, which I think was sold to me as a piece of Christmas wrapping paper. And I reckon I must have gone home that evening and got my scissors out and just thought, you know, I cannot cut this into little bits and wrap up biscuit tins and stuff with it. It's a work of art. So I kept it all these years. So we're going to use this reproduction and a few others uh, to have a look at this painting and see what we make of it. OK, what we're going to be looking at in detail a bit later on is actually the middle section of this. This is the complete work. It's an altarpiece and it was commissioned by a very rich man, Paolo Strozzi. And he paid <laughs> Fabriano a lot of money for doing it. And so it is um, very opulent. There's a lot of gold in it. It's quite flamboyant and showy. But I actually think there's quite a beautiful sensitivity to it uh, as well, which we'll see later on. Above and below the central panel, in three roundels at the top and three rectangular panels at the bottom, are incidents surrounding the life of Jesus. The Annunciation, where the Archangel Gabriel comes to tell Mary that she's going to have a child and to call him Jesus. Christ in glory. And at the bottom, the scenes of the Nativity, of the flight uh, into Egypt, where Jesus, Mary and Joseph have to flee the wrath of Herod and the presentation in the temple when Jesus is just a few days old. So that's the context but we're going to focus in on that central panel now. So here we are with the central section of de Fabriano's painting behind me. A few years ago I saw some interesting research where scientists put cameras on the edge of a painting and those cameras were able to track the movements of the pupils of the eyes of people who were looking at the painting. And what it showed was that when we come to look at a painting, our eyes do flick about and we look here and there in ways that we're only partly aware of, but then we tend to settle in a particular area. And uh, this particular picture is interesting in relation to that because I think that there's a lot going on in the picture. There's loads of details, there's you know, animals, birds, loads of people, all sorts of things happening. But in the end, I think De Fabriano uh, intends us to make a little journey and he's very sure where he wants us to arrive. Maybe that's kind of very fitting because of course, the painting itself is this story, uh, is a story of a journey. It's the story of the Magi, the wise men. And in the second part of the Bible, in the, in the New Testament, the first book, the Gospel of Matthew, and the second chapter, tells us about the wise men. And they're often, as in this painting, described as kings, which they probably weren't, to be honest, and they're usually depicted as being uh, three of them. But that's really because the biblical text talks about three gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But that's what we're going to see in this painting, of course, the, the arrival of the three kings uh, in uh, Bethlehem, and they're going to be coming to see the baby Jesus and to honour him. Now, this painting, of course, comes from an era when there was no film, and if you wanted to show a narrative, a story, with a sequence in it, a sequence of events, you could either, I guess, just show various different phases, like a cartoon, different works of art. Uh, but what's happened here is what also happened more frequently, that is that you've got all the scenes into one image. So what that means for this painting is that the wise men appear several times in, in the one frame you know, as a way of telling the story. So up here in the top corner, we've got the beginning of the story 
uh, three little wise men up in the corner here and they are seeing the star which sets them off on their journey to go and see the Christ child then they reappear here in this little section easily identified because they've got their holy halo discs and here they've reached the point where they're going to go up into Jerusalem and meet up with Herod the king and he, he's going to express a lot of interest in the fact that there's a new king supposedly being born in his area and so he says to them you know do come back and perhaps I can go and worship him as well he was a crafty so-and-so Herod and we know actually from his later years that he was also quite paranoid about uh, people taking over his role and, and so it fits very well with the biblical story that he was uh, wanting to know uh, where this new supposed king might be. Then over here we get the three wise men again and uh, here they're going to Bethlehem and they're going to be uh, coming to the end near the end of their journey. So there's a very clear structure in the painting. It's taking us from the very first event right the way through the story until then we're going to flow down into the central uh, action down here because this of course is the area where uh, the main interest of the of the painting is and this is where the three kings have arrived and here is the the stable it actually looks like a cave and in fact there's quite a debate about whether the word stable is a good inter a good um, translation of the word that's used in the Bible for where Jesus was born. But there's this sort of cave-like structure and the three kings have arrived and here are Joseph, Mary, baby Jesus. We've got the usual animals on scene, the, the ass and the ox. Here is the ass and he's kind of looking out at us as if to say, who are you calling an ass and what are you doing here anyway? The ox is a bit more helpful. He's very much looking in this direction and is framed in such a way that it's very clear everybody actually is pointing down to this area here. The kings are inclined that way. The heads here of Joseph and Mary were all being steered towards this particular point. And these two arcs, they kind of frame for us what we're supposed to be looking at. And there's something very interesting uh, about this, these two arcs, and particularly about this one. Now we could of course see this as a rising arc from left to right, which would reflect the order in which the kings are going to give their gifts, first, second and third. But because the characters are all looking from right to left, and at the bottom of the painting the flow has been from right to left, I think we tend to see this as an arc that is going from right to left, one, two, three. In other words, a descending arc. And if that's so, I think De Fabriano has done something really rather special here, because has he not shown us in that descending arc the sequence that this king has gone through? Beginning, upright, coming more towards a bowing motion. Do you see how when this king removes his crown it will come off like this and therefore emphasise this downward moving arc until eventually we come to this prostrate position. So just as there is a sequence at the top of the painting in the way that the wise men appear more than once, so it's as if here in this falling motion we've seen the sequence that this first king has gone through. And the other thing I can't help noticing is the ages of these different kings. A beardless youth a slightly older man, and very much an old man here. And so again, a sense of progression through stages, this time through the stages of life itself. In light of all that, a few reflections on these different characters. And so our attention is drawn firstly to the young man on the right. And, uh, well, he cuts quite an impressive figure, doesn't he? He's quite dashing. He still has his crown on his head. He's some way off from removing it. He's, his right hand has his uh, gift in and it, he's holding it rather daintily and he's expensively dressed and he looks uh, quite the young man about town. 
But who is that at his feet? Is that a servant who's dutifully removing those very fine spurs that the young king is wearing? Or is he a bit of a chancer? Is he a kind of 15th century equivalent of a pickpocket who spotted his opportunity? I don't know. But whatever, it slightly punctures the sense of self-assurance that at first we see in that young man. And he is also standing on the coat, the cloak of the first king, uh, the one on the far left. But there he is, and he's an impressive person, but he maybe hasn't yet come to really decide whether or not that crown is going to come off. And so, to the left, to the next king, and here's a man, he's slightly older. He's seen a bit more of life, and he has made his decision because he has shifted his gift into his left hand and is in the process of removing his uh, crown. And as we saw, that will emphasise the arc of um, coming to that point of worship and reverence. So he is someone who's making his decision and is... Uh, well, the die is cast for him, and he is ready. And then, of course, finally we come, and it is finally, it is really journey's end in the painting, to this king who is an old man. And he has reached that point where he is ready to give his all. You know, when I look at this man, as I've done many times, actually, I sometimes can hear that uh, perhaps modern atheist voice that would look at this and say, dear, oh dear, religious groveling, a man who instead of standing up in the dignity of who he is as a human being is giving himself to nonsense and is uh, prostrating himself in worship. But you know, I wonder, I wonder if there are some things which can't really be understood properly unless you're on the inside. You know, people use the word objective quite a lot, don't they? Uh, as if the way to truth is really to, to stand on the outside and look in. And sometimes that's fair enough. But I wonder if this thing called worship is really only finally understood, if it's understood at all, because maybe it goes beyond language and thoughts, though it makes use of both of those on the way, maybe it can only be understood from the inside, and that seems to be where this old man is. And as for dignity, well, he seems to me gloriously free. To be honest, he couldn't care whether you and I are looking on. He doesn't care what he looks like. He's cast his uh, crown off in the corner, he's given his gift, he's totally absorbed in this act of worship. He's gloriously free. I remember an American friend called Patty, we were once having a talk and she was reading something in the paper and she said, Steve, don't you think most people take themselves so seriously? And we both burst out laughing. But I guess a lot of the time in life we're very concerned about the impression that we give and what people think of us, whether it's what we're wearing or how much money we have or whatever. And here is a man who's got beyond that and he's totally absorbed. And who is it that he's worshipping? Well, here's the extraordinary thing. There's a verse in the Old Testament in one of the Psalms, Psalm 95 and verse 6, which says, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel. But who are we supposed to kneel to? Well, it says, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And yet here is this king, and he is worshipping and giving reverence to a little human child. And so here, of course, is the central Christian affirmation, this astonishing claim that in this baby, which here Mary uh, offers, as it were, out of her middle, and balances delicately before this king, that in this, this baby we have that which is fully divine as well as fully human, and therefore can be worshipped. This is the incarnation, the enfleshing, the embodiment of God. 
that truth which Christians have always wrestled to understand and speak of. That truth, the implications of which Christians have sometimes failed to live up to. As for example, when the body and physical life has been disparaged, forgetting that that which God himself has taken up should hardly be rejected. It's not easy to understand and to speak of, and not easy to live up to. But here it is, and this wise man is bringing his worship. And the expression of that worship takes the form of a kiss. One of the words used in the Bible for worship in the New Testament, proskuneo, the root meaning of it is to draw near, to kiss. And that's what he's doing here. Our three magi have come to give homage to a king. And one way that homage was given to kings was to kiss their feet. When you kissed the foot of a king, you were admitting that you were, as it were, their, their vassal, you were subservient to them. And when you were kissing their feet, of course, you were yourself vulnerable and fragile. You could do them no harm, but in that action you were bearing your own head. And so you were making yourself fragile, vulnerable. And as this king offers his worship in this way, we see how the Christ child's hand is reached out to touch his head in a kind of blessing. And so there's a beautiful symmetry in this central act. We could ask which comes first. Is it the kiss of worship? Or is it the hand that blesses? And we can't really answer that question looking at this picture. Which prompts me to offer this thought to my Christian brothers and sisters. That perhaps we can make the mistake of concentrating too much on the idea of receiving a blessing. And that we do well simply to concentrate as this wise man does simply on the act of giving and then perhaps even to be surprised at how we find ourselves blessed. And so the Magi's journey to Bethlehem has reached its goal. They will now make a return journey home by a different route so as to avoid crafty Herod. Perhaps they return home changed by what they've experienced, by what they've seen and heard. And our journey together with them and with this painting now comes to its close. Hope you've enjoyed travelling together and maybe we'll meet up again sometime soon.